with equipment and it should have it by next week. So if you'd like to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26 and just keep your finger in there and maybe you can guess, try and guess what verse I'm going to be on. We're actually going to take a little, um, uh, a little um, excursion, if you will, to bring out a principle. Because this is towards the end of Jesus' life, we are actually still at the end of his second year, and we'll get back to that. Lord, thank you again for another day uh, that we can come together as a body, body of Christ. And we pray throughout the foothills, Lord, as people gather in your name, that you would be lifted up, that you would be praised, that you would be thanked, and that your spirit would open the eyes of our hearts, that we might understand more, more not just for knowledge, but for the grace of knowing you and living in your freedom. And we praise you for that. So guide us this morning as uh, we continue now. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, I don't know if you noticed um, in that little movie, the little video clip, about uh, was there a, uh, a disparity between the old and the young? And what, what was most, um, what, what did you see most graphically? The older folk were completely engaged. The younger folk were completely disengaged. <laughs> now we're not trying to slam young people, but... Uh, I think when you hear what I'm going to say in, a, in this intro, you'll kind of know why. The National Center for Biotechnology reports that the average attention span of a person in the year 2000 was 12 seconds. Yeah. Now, nearly 20 years later, the attention span is 8 seconds. Yeah. Research also shows that we as a society are in competition with a close competitor that has an average attention span of nine seconds. And that's a goldfish. <laughs> so the sad reality is that the typical human is trailing goldfish by one second in attention span. Now, oh, there's hope. There's hope because we do have the capacity to train our attention on things that we're really interested in. However, there are three factors that decide our interest. The first factor is the hotness of the topic. Now, for you older people, what that means, not, ouch, ooh, it's hot, it means it's really cool. <laughs> and you see how old I am when I say really cool? Actually, today they'd say, it's really sick. That's weird. <laughs> it's really sick. I remember when we used to say, that's bad, which meant it was good. So the first factor is the hotness of the topic. The second one is its relevance to how it benefits you or me publicly. What's it going to do for me? And the third one is the desire for a new topic because of boredom with the old topic. Now, information, as we know, and you know, information will increase prior to Jesus' coming, and I don't know what more is there to do. <laughs> it's at a pretty rapid rate right now. But information and topics are becoming more popular quickly. But they're becoming disinterested in those topics 
at an alarming increased rate. So the question is this. How do we get one's attention to stay focused? Now I have a little song up here. I want to flash that up. Remember this? Now I've picked certain uh, verses to blend together. But see what you hear or hear what you see in this. You ready? Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Oh, to the grace of towards our dilemma these days. What? How about prone to wander? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. And if the stats are correct, I mean, we all kind of say, what? 12 seconds? 8 seconds? I, I was doing a little monitoring of myself and I saw how true that is when you're not really focused. Yeah. Do you know uh, that the interest levels of people on various things will determine their attention span? The typical college student. Your typical college student pays attention an average of 10 minutes because their thoughts are, where's the next party? Men, typical men, talking about relationship issues, six minutes. That's it. But talking about football, cars, trucks, electronic components, fishing, 15 minutes straight without losing a beat. Yeah. Hey, go guys. Yes. Typical women have been shown to be more tuned in to verbal and relational communication, which will last more than 6 or 15 minutes, more like 30 minutes and beyond. <laughs> now, we have an issue with a lack of attention. A lack of attention causes, they say, one in five people to forget something simple at least once a week, like, where's my keys or where's my phone? I couldn't verify the number or how they got it, but along with that statistic was that the average American loses somewhere around $5,600 close to it over their lifetime because of inattention, because of forgetting things. 67% of those surveyed who struggle with giving something their undivided attention are very heavy social media users. Where we are with social media, I mean, it's like doom, doom, boom, on to the next thing. The average millennial will spend a whole one minute on a website before they go on to the next one. 45% of adults say they're easily distracted by daydreaming at work, at school. Hey, what about church? <laughs> what a day for a daydream. Remember that? No, the reality we face is that without an alert spirit, 
our minds will wander. So that's why we sang what we sang. God, come help us stay focused because we are prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Now the last time we were together, we saw and heard Jesus and we saw and got to know the heart of God because Jesus' intentions were to reveal, to implant and then enable us to impart the heart of our triune God to others, to impart his heart to others, that they would receive and believe. <clears throat> However, let's realize something right now. Let's realize that our greatest threat and hindrance is not the devil. Our greatest threats and hindrance are our own hearts that are prone to wander. You know, like with distractions. Phones ringing. Everybody craning their that, that neck. Was, that was Danielle. It wasn't the devil. So the reason that I feel I was led to go to this place to talk about this particular principle that we're going to say because we, uh, that we're going to look at is because once you have received and once it's been implanted in your heart, we need to be sober to share it. To impart it. it needs to be. You were not saved. We were not saved for us. I remember that. Jesus died for you, for Him. That's right. He owns us. We are not our own. We were bought with a price. Therefore, we honor God with our whole put together not just our body. So let's look at Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse 40. We're in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's just moments before Jesus is going to be arrested. And he came to his disciples and I'll backtrack a minute, but I want to jump in right here. He came to his disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Is an hour too long to pray? I believe Jesus' disappointment here was with them that they could not keep watch with Him. When you and I pray, the Lord is with us. You're not here going, Hey God, can you hear me up there? Remember last week? When the Lord came down and stood next to Moses after they had prayed? He's here. And so, even though you're praying to him, you're praying right there with him. You're having a conversation with our God. And that's where I believe it wasn't about a time limit, although we'll talk, maybe hint on that a little bit, because time flies when you're having fun. And I don't know, you don't have to raise your hand, but I know people and I will say myself included, who I can't believe that an hour went by in prayer. It's an hour? Wow. Because when you're talking to somebody you love, it's timeless. You're not distracted. I believe Jesus' disappointment with them wasn't so much you're sleeping, oh, but they were tired. 
You know, they had a long day. They had just had that big old meal for the Last Supper, you know. Needed a siesta. You could not keep watch with me. They give in, they gave in, right? They gave in to their impulses. They give in to their lack of attentiveness. Uh, and their insensitivity to something. Their insensitivity to Jesus' urgency. To his need. To Jesus' need. Look what he said in verse 38. Look at verse 38. He says, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. Jesus pouring out his heart. A couple of thoughts for us here. Practical thoughts. Are we internalizing people's needs and prayer requests? Or are they just pew? When someone shares, are we internalizing? Are we feeling? Are we sensing their pain? We have to ask ourselves, what's our compassion level? People generally don't care how much you know. They need to know how much you care. And does God's heart of compassion dwell in you? Jesus' heart broke over so many things. Lack of faith. Uh, people seeming like they were sheep without a shepherd. Disorientation. Does your heart break when you see the homeless? My heart breaks often when I see the people coming at food closet. I'm so grateful for those who are there to minister every Thursday. If you want to be blessed, come out on Thursday. So being compassionate is part of the heart of God. It's a vital part in our life and ministry. It's one thing that I, I enjoyed teaching at uh, the Christian school where I was and I taught Bible. But one thing that was different about doing that and doing ministry in churches and getting to know people. When the bell rang, beep, they were gone and a new group came in. And beep, 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 gone, a new group comes in. And at least I tried to get to know everybody's name. I didn't quite get into everybody's life. But then if I was coaching, which I did, I get to know them a little better. But ministry is getting into people's lives. It's not just giving information in, a, in any context. Also, remember what I said? You're praying. You're not praying to Jesus out there. Praying to Jesus right here. You know why? Because he, God, is omnipresent. He is everywhere all the time simultaneously. He is with you. He is with us. And that means if he's with you, then you're with him all the time everywhere. And his orders to them in this verse were remain here and keep watch. And since we're not omnipresent, here's a good little practical tip. It's good practice to draw close and pray and intercede immediately with someone or about something when you're asked. Do it on the spot because our attention span is what it is. And I, I envy those people who have prayer lists. I, I'm not a list person because I, I think I can remember. <laughs> Just like 
I think I can see all the time, and I wonder, why is that blurry? Something wrong with that paper. Oh, listen, you guys. When he said, remain here and keep watch, again, the Holy Spirit used specific words to get the point across. Remain here is one word that means wherever and whenever you are. It's in a grammatical form, an aorist tense, which means it's any time it presents itself. Where is your here? Is your here here now? Is your here in, this, in the car? Is your here at home? Is, where is your here? Remain here. See? And keep watch. And keep watch, keep watch, is plur- and these are plural, so he's addressing the disciples there, but it's like God's addressing all, all of us people. This is a, a present active imperative. Keep watch. Keep watch. I remember in the Air Force when I was at, down at Lackland, and, uh, you know, when you're coming out of the hippie life, and then all of a sudden I saw my head, because I used to have a lot of hair. And then in, you know, in, in eight weeks or however long it was, they were going to make me a soldier, you know, fly boy. Well, I remember uh, one evening, we all, I was called the house mouse. Everybody got different jobs at Lackland. There was the latrine queen. (laughs) Were you the latrine queen? Oh, man. (laughs) I love you, bro. (laughs) (laughs) And there were all kinds of various jobs, pickup jobs. I was the house mouse, and what that meant is I had to clean the, uh, the sergeant's uh, office, keep his office in check and stuff. But everybody took a turn on night watch, okay? So here we are in the dorm, and there's a little window, in the, in, and I'm, you know, making believe I had a gun, watching out the window, night watch. And I had the 12 midnight to, you know, three, two, or two hour shifts or three hour shifts. And, and I'm there. <laughs> I'm not used to being awake. I want to sleep. See? And I found myself going, see me? Anybody see me fall asleep? Yeah. Ever happened to you, Mike? I took that thought and translated it in my spiritual life. Have I fallen asleep praying for my wife? Have I fallen asleep praying for my kids, my grandkids? I'm supposed to be on watch. That, that's an imperative, a present imperative command. The war never ends. It's a 24-7. You've heard people say, we have the spiritual armor of God, right? Don't take it off when you go to sleep. Wear it. So if you're asked to pray, that's your here at that moment. Pray for that person right now. Could be on the phone, could be in person, because people will ask, hey, can you remember in prayer? Can you pray for this? Can you pray for that? Jesus is admonishing them in verse 40 that prayer is not a quick one and done. It's not a little chat with God, but it's a spiritual discipline that is developed. An hour in fervent prayer is not too much to ask when we can spend hours on entertainment, hobbies, and recreation. 
Now, my wife went shopping yesterday because she's a, a pastor wife's widow on Saturdays because I'm usually sermonizing, so she goes shopping. And this morning she realized I was doing more than just watching the LSU Alabama game. Because this morning she went, ah, looked out the window. You fed the, the bird feeders. You put food in the feeders. And that was a one for me. <laughs> yeah, I went right there. You thought I was sitting on the couch watching a football game, huh, honey? I was able to do that during a commercial. <laughs> Score. No, fervent prayer is something that we need to get used to. I believe that Jesus is crying out about this urgency and it's warranting continued attention by his closest people, his disciples, the people who should have his back, at least spiritually. People's needs and circumstances demand alertness, endurance, and staying grace. And that's, that's fervent prayer. And we need to learn it. We need to learn it. I mean, if Jesus says you can move mountains, if anything you ask for, it could happen. If a man like Elijah who was a human being like us, could pray in God's will that it wouldn't rain. And it didn't rain until he prayed again. And then it rained. Don't you think that your prayers can be that effective? I believe it. Often, when we're in a situation that seems insurmountable, you know, like dealing with, PG&E, or, you know, some government situation, I go right to Proverbs chapter 31, verse 1, seriously. And I have seen God move government. It says, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And like channels of water, he turns it whichever way he wishes. God's in control. God's in control. Remember that. But let's not be timid to pray fervently in the will of God. So, verse 40, he says, And he came to his disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for an hour. Then he goes on, and here's the principle that we'll pick up on. Verse 41, keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Our translators in our Bibles are trying to unpack the urgency of intercession. The Holy Spirit chose words, these words, watch and pray. Which in the Greek are active words, they're not passive. But the translators added the word keep. And then they put ing on the end of the two words. Watching and praying. To do what? To emphasize the importance and the necessity of continual intercession and vigilance for loved ones, for people groups. For those in authority. For situations and circumstances in general. Listen. Our president, the office, not the personality, the office is being attacked. You understand what I'm saying? 
the person and the personality is what it is and accountability should be where accountability is. But the, the ease of attacking the position, the office, lends itself towards anarchy. When we lose respect for authority, then we must raise up a banner when the enemy comes in like a flood. And the negativism is so rampant, we have to pray against negativism and pray for truth. Shut the mouths of liars and bring the truth to bear. I'm not talking partisan. I'm talking what preserves a people. But look what Jesus says here. Where's the priority? The priority in this verse 41 is you. The first and foremost priority is personal protection. Pray that you may not enter or come into temptation. If you're not healthy in spirit, soul, and flesh, those around you are in jeopardy. That's why Jesus, I mean, it's plural, but he's talking to them, but he's talking to uh, Peter as well, because Peter was the spokesman. But he's talking to them, he's talking to us. Notice those two words. In, in Mark, it says, come into temptation. Here in Matthew, it says, enter. And, and picture it. Entering into a room. Getting involved with temptation. If we're not alert, we'll get involved. Or, we should have been going this way, and being distracted, we came this way. Either way, it's because of a lack of health, spiritual health in, in the individual. If you are not healthy, those around you are in jeopardy. Temptations never end. Even Jesus had to deal with them throughout his ministry. In Luke 4, 13, it says this. When the devil had finished every temptation, and that's the wilderness temptations, he departed from him, Jesus, until an opportune time. He's never going away. And you defeat him here, and he'll do an end around. And you got to defeat him here, and defeat him here, 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 continually. I like the way the message put it in this one little phrase. The devil retreated temporarily, lying in wait for another opportunity. The devil and his demons are opportunists. They will take advantage of whatever you give them. Okay. Yeah. Well, I didn't mean it. Too late. Okay. It's no different for us. So we need to be healthy. Now I'm going to try this. The attention deficit experts say this. That every 20 minutes or 25 minutes, you should give people a time to pause and reflect. So I'm going to give you a five-minute break right now. Maybe three minutes. Because I want to keep talking. No. <laughs> I want to bore you more. I want you to talk to the people next to you for the next few minutes, few moments, and process what you've heard so far. What have you heard? Because we're going to conclude with the most profound insight that we need to really grasp. And we'll all face it. So share uh, with the people next to you for a few moments. Or share with them... Uh, what you daydream about. Just be careful about details. 
or just stretch? But don't get up and leave the room, unless you have to. Streams of mercy never cease. things about some of the folks that you shared with, got a little insight, able to pray for them. Some of them will be an hour, some five hours. Yeah. So look at verse 41, because here's where Jesus says, look, this is where the rubber meets the road. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. All right, this is reality now. Now, Jesus is not talking about the Holy Spirit here. 
He's talking about their and our spirit. He's talking about our, your spirit, our spirit. And thank you, Father, that the Holy Spirit does engage us. You look at Romans 8, 16, and 17, it says this, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. It's all there for us, but we're the ones who must believe it. We have to embrace it. And live in it. Not like that helpless man in Mark 9.24. Who was ineffective in the situation with his son. He says, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Why? Why do you have unbelief? Why is there unbelief? Hmm? Disobedience. Not praying. Not a... a Knowing who you are. It says the flesh is weak. The flesh is weak. The flesh is weak is our crucible. You're always dealing with your flesh. Some people are more entertained by their flesh than their spirit. I feel sorry for them. The flesh is weak is our adversary. The flesh is weak is our affliction. It's our challenge to overcome. Why? Why? Because we're prone. We are prone. The flesh is formatted. The flesh is patterned and modeled by the old sin nature. Now, this is a theological debate that I have no problem taking on. Some people think we have two natures, a sin nature and a, and a new nature. I don't believe that. The old nature is on the cross. The new nature is ours. But the flesh is patterned after the old nature. That's why we continue to sin. We're not in this, you know, argument back and forth. And basically, this uh, theological debate comes up with different translations of the scripture. So you got to go back a little bit further than that. But the flesh is patterned and modeled and, and molded by the old nature. It remembers. The flesh is predisposed to react naturally. You know why you react naturally? Because of the flesh. It's susceptible to former enticements. Why do I easily get tempted? Because the flesh is still strong in, in that individual. And those enticements are right there. It's inclined to take the easy way out. That's the flesh. Its tendency is to lie or hide. It has a will. Do you know the flesh has a will? And it's opposed to the Holy Spirit's prompting. Listen to Galatians 5.16. The flesh sets its desire against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. These are in opposition to one another. They're constantly clashing. So that you may not do the things that you please. Walk by the spirit and you'll not carry out the desire of the flesh. The flesh will stumble you. It's that simple. The spirit will guide you. The flesh is weak because we're prone and we wander. We drift off when someone is talking because we're undisciplined listeners. We're usually thinking about what we want to say rather than listening to what the person is saying and internalizing, listening. We go off on a tangent, voicing our own opinions rather than the truth. We roam to escape accountability. In Isaiah 29.10, it tells us that people will be given a spirit of slumber. And that's not, I'm sleepy. 
although sometimes it manifests itself that way. I mean, you ever notice when you're talking truth with somebody, you're talking, talking, then you get around to something really uh, necessary in their life, and the lights go out? Or, I'm going, wow. <laughs> there it is. That's the spirit of slumber. Oh, maybe they didn't get enough sleep. Why are you judging, Lou? Uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> the proof is in the pudding. Show me your fruit. See, a spirit of slumber is emotions that numb or dull, dull our senses. It's emotions that numb or dull our senses. Listen to Jesus in Luke 22, verse 31. He's talking to Peter. He calls him Simon. Why does he call him Simon? <laughs> I think when Jesus goes to call him Simon instead of Peter, it's because he's back in the flesh, because he's back in the old life. That's my opinion. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. I mean, it happened with Job. Satan couldn't do anything until he asked permission. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, in other words, you're going to fail. <laughs> Strengthen your brothers. And I love this about Jesus. What's awesome about Jesus praying for us, when he prays for us, when he intercedes, it's effective before we fall short and also after once we've repented and come back to our senses. You see, Peter could have stood strong and Jesus prayed and he was a man of faith and he said no to the temptation of what? to denying Jesus three times, right? He could have said, no, no, the first time, I'm, I'm a disciple of Christ. But then it ex you need faith after you fall, right? You need faith not to get lost in a pity party. You need faith to get up again and strengthen your brothers. I said it last time, there's no one better to be part of a healing ministry than those who have been healed. There's no one better to be part of deliverance ministry than those who have been delivered. See? So it's not the bigger problem. The bigger problem than failing is failing to stand up after we've failed. It's, it, it, it's let's get back into it and strengthen those who are coming after you. I just want to close with this. We need to be strong in spirit. The spirit is willing. Spirit is willing. He's not talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about your spirit. That's why you and I say, oh yeah, oh gosh, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Oh yes. It's like James says, we look in a mirror and then we forget once we walk away from the mirror. We need to be strong in spirit. When your spirit recognizes something, nail it down. We need to be overcomers. Here's why. The Holy Spirit said it through Peter in 1 Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is at hand. I mean, that was not quite 2,000 years ago he said that. But we're closer now than they were. But he said it prophetically, didn't he? Because there were so many things that had to happen. The Jews had to be back into their homeland and nobody was going to get them out anymore. The communication that's here now. There's lots of factors. I, I don't know what else needs to happen. I hope it happens soon. But it says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore... Be of sober judgment, that means sober-mindedness, and sober spirit, here's why, for the purpose 
of prayer. For the purpose of prayer. God wants us to be praying people. There's a sign over those double doors as you walk in. My house is a house of prayer for all nations. He wants us to be praying people. What did Harun pray over us? That a spirit of prayer would come over this church. Well, let's practice ourselves. Practice. Oh, well, I don't have time to pray for an hour. Well, get up earlier. <laughs> uh, you can pray with your eyes open. If you have a commute, just start praying. Keep your eyes open and pray. Remember, prayer is not a posture. It's not some kind of a, 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 a pious demeanor. You know, prayer is talking to God. Talking to your loved one. Talking like you're talking to someone you really love. And listening and talking. The end of all things is at hand. In the Greek it says, be sober and sober. Sober minded, sober spirit. So that we can pray. The spirit is willing, amen? amen. Let's overcome the flesh. Let's overcome the flesh. Let's be overcomers. Let's stand. Lord, thank you again. Thank you that we could... Uh, so many things today, Lord. So many things that touched our hearts, touched our lives. And we're grateful because we weren't doing it for us. We were doing it for you. But yet, we are the benefactors. We're the blessed ones. Because we've come in your name. We've come to honor you. Even though we do thank and honor various people, it's the right thing to do. We're grateful people. But our gratitude far exceeds the things that we accomplish in this life. Because we always look to you, our Savior, our Savior, our God, the lover of our soul. Lord, help us to be strong in spirit, that we would walk in the spirit and not give in to the impulses of the flesh. Love you, Jesus. May we go out from this place and be bearers of good news. The good news of how you've changed our life. The good news of how you can change the people that we talk to. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great day in the Lord.